Before we start, does everybody have a stone? Did everybody get a stone? Anybody not have a stone? Okay, you know, stone. Keep your hands up. It, it, is, it isn't a good Christian walk unless we have stones in our, uh, in our life. We need rocks. We need things to carry around to make us uncomfortable. Amen? Everybody make sure. And as Christians, we like big rocks. The bigger the ones we can carry, the, the, the more holy and Christian-like we are. So just, If you need two or three, there's plenty. Take all the rocks you need. Amen? Again, like Pastor just said, to the moms here, grace and blessings into your lives today uh, for what you've done for those around us. So let's pray. Lord, we are excited about today. I am. I don't know how excited we'll be when we're done, but we, uh, we are glad to be in your house. Uh, glad we are in a country where it's free to do what we do, uh, stand up in public, and like Pastor said, to proclaim your word in truth, in boldness. Uh, we pray for our brothers and sisters who are in places that we couldn't find on a map who are doing what we're trying to do in secret, having their churches burned, their homes burned, their children kidnapped, because they dare, they dare to confess you as Savior and Lord. So in this place today, we have freedom to do that. Let us do it in that, in a freedom uh, that uh, goes beyond anything that we can understand apart from you, Lord. And so we just turn this time to you, know you'll do exactly what you want to do and how you want to do it. And we ask it in your name, Jesus. Amen. In, uh, in our judicial system, our justice system, we have two types of sentencing. We have determinate sentencing, and we have indeterminate sentencing. Determinate sentencing is just that. You have a misdemeanor, you have a felony or whatever it is, and by law, you get six months, eight months, a year, whatever it is. And when it's determined, it has a starting point, and it has a determined ending point. Then there's indeterminate sensing. I'm going to look at Kitty because she told me I don't always look at the same people. So look at it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Then we have indeterminate sensing, which is you commit a crime, one to five, three to eight, five to ten. It has a definite starting point, but an indeterminate ending point. Because once you get there, those are parole board. You might get time off for good behavior and get out early. Or you might get in prison, not learn your lesson, do stupid things, and they add time to it. So you get beyond what that sentencing was. Okay? Determinant, indeterminant. And we all are in here, right, in these natural bodies, come with an expiration date. Anybody? Amen? What? We all come in, and we're all going out. We just don't know what that dash part is, but it, it, come in, going out. Amen? Amen. So for the last couple of months, if I can ask a question, the Lord's been kind of talking to me in, in, in study time, and the question he asked me was, Dave, is there an expiration date on your anger? Is there an expiration date on the grudges that you may feel you think you can hold against someone? Does it have a beginning time and an ending time? Is it determined? Or do you think I have some right, Dave, to put you in some sort of sentence and keep you there until I feel you have the right to be set free? That's a tough question. Because to be truthful, I have a lot of those. A lot of those. And I started thinking, I was like, well, maybe as, as this day comes, as Sunday has arrived, maybe there's some husbands that have a wife that they have held in an indeterminate sentence for something. And maybe there's wives here that are holding their husband in some sort of sentencing for something they did. And you know what? It doesn't matter how long we're in it. 
you're going to stay in it until I think you're ready to get out of it. We have it against children. Am I a parent? Did I have that same grudge? Do I have that same sort of determinant sensing that I feel I can, I can hold against one of my children? All of my children? How about brothers and sisters in Christ? Anybody in here think they got uh, something that they're holding against somebody in here that they have the right to do? I think the truth be known, all of us do. All of us do. See, with the prodigal son, the story of the prodigal son, both sons were in the same house, correct? They were in the house with the father. One son thought he knew what was happening in the house. He was obeying the rules and all that stuff, and he was feeling pretty good about himself. The other son said, you know what? I'm in the house. I don't like the house. Give me what's mine. I'm going out of the house. But the problem is they both lived in the house, and they both missed the love of the father. Amen? And the question he was asking me is, Dave, you're in the house. You're in God's house. But how much of the love of the father are you really grasping? And I had to be real honest with myself, because when I study, I study in the back seat of my car every morning, and there's not a whole lot of room to go anywhere. There's not a whole lot of room to look around and see who I should be looking at and who's looking at me, because in that back seat of that car, it's just me and the Lord. And you've got to get real honest. Amen? So that's just a question. Is there anyone here that might, just might, have some of these things that we're holding people in a sentence that doesn't have an expiration date. And then I was thinking, it says, the Lord told me, he said, Dave, when you get to heaven, right, you're going to get to heaven and Jesus is going to meet you there. And he's going to say, you know what, Dave? I've been waiting a couple of thousand years for you to get here. I've just been hanging out in heaven waiting for you. And he says, now that you're here, Dave, I want to get a few things off of my chest before I let you in. Remember when, you remember that one? The one oh, you don't remember? How about, do you remember that one? I sure do. I died for it. I remember all of them. And then he's going to hold out those nail-pierced hands and said, you see what I did for you? He's not going to do that. Is he? That's what we do. We're going to get there, and Jesus is going to hold out those nails pierced hands, wide open, hug us, and say, Welcome home, child. Amen. Welcome home, child. Let's open our Bibles to Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12 and 14. And God's word says, the Bible says, starting in verse, 14, in verse 12 of Colossians 3, Therefore, and therefore is everything that came before, the, the old man that we've put off, all of the things that we've put off, right? All the immorality and the angers, you can read all of that in Colossians and Ephesians. We put those off. And like Pastor Rick said, these aren't suggestions, these are a command. We are commanded like an old garment to take these things off and put off means to throw away, cast far from us. And then when you read further, there it says we put on the new man, the new man, clothed in Christ, clothed in all the things that it says, compassion, kindness, humility. We put those new things on by command. Verse 13, bear with each other and what? For, forgive some things and some grievances. No. It says what we do is we forgive whatever, all grievances, offenses, you may have against one another. Now, guess what? This is the Bible. I like Billy Graham. And the Bible says... If the Bible says we are forget these grievances we have one for another, that means we have grievances one for 
the other. I said we might not get too happy by the time we're done, but hallelujah, it's what's happening. We, everyone in this room, whether we want to admit it or not, because guess who already knows already, believe it or not, what the grievances are. But he says, once we come to that point, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. Well, that was Jesus. I'm not Jesus. No, we're not Jesus. But again, this is the Bible, and it's not going to tell us anything that we can't do. The thing is, we can't do it. But the Christ in us, that Christ likeness, will bring us to that place where we can do it. Amen. Where we can do it. And it says, and over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Because the thing about it, saints, that we may look real good on the outside. I mean, we're looking good on the outside. And we are forgiven by Christ's cross and the shedding of his blood, are we forgiven? But that does not mean that once we are forgiven, we do not give room for these other things to creep back into our lives. Amen? I can, I'm talking about me. Pastor Rick and I have talked. We meet every Sunday morning. And I told him, I, I have a fear that as Orange Coast Community Church, we are doing really, really good on the outside. But there are some things going on that if we don't deal with the inside, I have a fear that God will say, you know what? Just like many other churches, there's a sign out there that says Orange Coast Community Church. But if we don't deal with some of the stuff we have to deal with, we will be just a sign. We will be just a sign. And I'm going to do my best with the help of God not to let that happen. Amen. Because I'll, I'll tell you right now, in front of God first, because he's the one who saved me, I'll repent in front of God right now for any offense that I have caused to anyone in this room. And ask if I have done that, to please forgive me and meet with me, talk to me, and we will make those things right. Amen? Amen. And we have to do that one to the other. We have to do that one to the other. In John 13, when the disciples should have been falling all over themselves to wash the feet of Jesus, they sat there and sat there and missed the whole point until Jesus says, you don't get it. I will gird my feet, my waist, and wash all of your feet. And he says, I will do this. I will humble myself. I will wash your feet and let this be an example to all of you. And what did he say? He says, I give you a new command. It wasn't new. Leviticus 19, Moses said it, love your neighbor as yourself. That was the original command. Christ said it's new. Why? Because there's a different standard now. You're not going to love each other like you love each other. You're going to love each other talking to the church as I have loved you. And he says, the people, they'll know that you are my disciples by that love, one for another. They're not going to know we're the church because I feed people for 10 years. They're not going to know to love one another because I sit up here and get a holy dance on and I lift my hands. Mark 6 says you can lift your hands and you can praise and you can jump and shout, but if you have an ought with a brother one for another, you better go take care of it because your worth it is worthless to me. Amen. Think about that, saints. Think about that, friends. We were raising our hands and we were singing and shouting, but what is in your heart? If the heart is not open and pure to the things that God has as far as forgiveness comes and getting over the grievances, you know what? I love Pastor Rick. He wants us to sing. But if you can't, sit there and be quiet because your silence is all you're giving the Lord. We need to. 
We need to. And there, there's some brothers and sisters in the church that in my thoughts have not been correct. And I will be searching you out and, and asking not just here in front, but personally for the things that I have to do. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 15. See, this is why when Rick says, you have an outline, I said, no, just put assorted scriptures. <laughs> just put... <laughs> go, to, go to 1 Kings chapter 15, please. When you're there, just say amen. And if you're not, catch up. Okay, 1 Kings chapter 15. In the 18th year of the reign of Jeroboam, which is 913 B.C., son of Nabat, Abijah became king of Judah. And he reigned in Jerusalem for three years. His mother was Mekah, the daughter Absalom, which is just a different setting. It was Absalom's daughter. He, excuse me, Abijah, committed all the sins as his father had done before him. And you can read about that if you just go over to 1 Kings 14. 22 to 24, all the temple prostitutes, Ashwip, all the idolatry that the fathers did before, he did. Okay? He committed all the sons, the sins his father had done before him. His heart was not fully devoted to the Lord. Interesting. Fully devoted. That's why Caleb got the blessing he did, because his heart was undivided, fully attentive to all the things that God had. And his heart wasn't devoted, fully devoted, as his father David. So it says, verse 4, Nevertheless, for David's sake, the Lord gave him a lamp, an offspring, a king, right? Because God had made that, the Lord made that promise to David that there was going to be a continual, what? Reigning, a continual king, all the way until the son of, the son of David returns. Okay? So this is God keeping his promise. Nevertheless, for David's sake, he gave a, a lamp in Jerusalem by raising up a son to succeed him and making Jerusalem strong. For David had done what was right in the eyes of the Lord, right? And not had failed to keep any, any of the Lord's command all the days of his life except, except in the case of Uriah the Hittite. Except. Now, that kind of plays into the, all the other things we've been talking about. You know, you've been a really good husband, except. You've been a really, really, really good wife, except. Great church family, except. I got wonderful kids, except. I like pastors preaching, except. I like the music, except. I like blah, 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 except. Here's a news flash. This is one of the things God gave me to sit in the back seat of my car. God does not care about what we like or dislike. You understand that, right? He is not fretting one second in heaven, going, you know what? Dave didn't like that. You know, Carl... He, he ain't got a bad attitude about this. You know. it's, it's not God's problem, folks. It's my problem. My problem. Because I doubt very much if the Lord liked any of what had to do with that. When he prayed, it wasn't that he wasn't going to. He was just hoping there might be some other way. Nonetheless, Father, if there isn't, your will be done. And like we said so many times before, whose will am I trying to accomplish? Seriously, whose will am I trying to make happen in my family, in my church, at my job? Whose will am I portraying? Whose will am I trying to play out in my life? Do I do God's will if I like what's happening? Oh, I like that part, God. You know? I like what Pastor said. Given, like we said before, 99%, if we're doing this right, you're not going to like what we're saying. 
we're going to keep saying it. Have to. Okay, so we got the accept. Next question. Next question. How many people in here right now, right now, are living with the accept? Doesn't matter if it's A accept, two accepts, three accepts. How many accepts are we living with right now? Pretty soon we start, we have more accepts than what we like. Because you know the thing about an accept? An accept gives me the right to make an excuse. The accept gives me the right to add another accept. But see if I'm going, it's your will, Lord. It's your will. Okay, I don't understand it. Pray, give me wisdom. Guess what? I don't get to add that to a list of accepts. I get to add that to the list of growth. I get to add that to the list of I'm going to trust you in this, Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay. Except now, go to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 11 and chapter 12. Samuel then Kings. Okay. Now, we're all familiar with 2 Samuel 11 and chapter chapter 11 and chapter 12. It's all the accepts of David's life. Right? Went out on the flat roof, looked out. There's Bathsheba. Bathsheba's taken, blah, blah, blah. We know all of that stuff. Send somebody, go get the lady, take a bath, all of those things. All right? She's got a husband, Uriah. What am I going to do with Uriah? So Uriah was the husband of Bathsheba. David writes a letter, which is really amazing. You talk about cold-hearted. He writes Uriah's death certificate, gives it to Uriah and says, here, take this to Joab so when the arrows start flying, they're going to move everybody back and you're going to get shot up with arrows a bunch of times. <laughs> Paraphrase. You, I don't even mean you're going to think you're in a message. You're going to say it like that. But that's what happened. That's what happened. Here's David, God's chosen one, right? And he's going, okay, okay, Joab, I'm going to, here's this letter, and the guy who's going to carry it is, is a dead man walking, and here's what you're going to do when the battle gets fierce. Pull all the guys back, so he's basically standing there going, where's, the, where's, all, the, where's all my compadres? Okay? Not good stuff. And you got two chapters full of what isn't good stuff. And we overlook all of that. I mean, that, I'm not, we don't overlook it. We, that's where we focus. Whoa, Bathsheba and Uriah and Joab and it got him killed and wrote his own death certificate. Okay, look at 1 Samuel 12, verse 13. Amen? And that's just after... You know, the, the rich man went and stole the one person's one ewe lamb, and David goes crazy. Well, if some guy does that, he should burn. He should die. Right? That was David's response for stealing the lamb. 2 Samuel 12, verse 13. Then, after he had found out it was him, Nathan takes that bony finger, points it, and says, it's says, you, David. It's you. You're the one. So David says to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. People say, well, what about Uriah? What about Bathsheba? What about Bathsheba's mother? Yes, but ultimately, David says, ultimately, all sins are against God. Amen? And it says there, it's interesting, it says, I have sinned. In the Hebrew, it's hata. In Greek, it's the harmatia. Okay? Sin. And we always say, miss the mark. Right? And it sounds, it sounds a little innocuous. I just miss the mark. Here's what we don't understand, friends. You know when you're playing darts? You know you're shooting darts? You know you got a bullseye, and your dart board's about this big, and that's just a little bit to the right. And oh, just about made it. Just missed the bullseye. Right? Or archery, the target's a little bigger. You know, you got a bullseye about this big, and you can stand back, you know, and you got the big circles like this. Uh, still, I'm out in the red, maybe a foot and a half. Still, I just missed. We don't understand what just missed the mark 
means. Say Orange or California or the United States was the bullseye. Right? Earth. The globe was the bullseye. And I'm sitting there. And it just goes. We don't understand what we mean when we say we missed the mark. We have this little incremental off. I can just go, you know, come on, Dave. Just it, No. No, 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 no. It didn't matter how big the target is. It doesn't matter how big the bullseye is. We cannot get close. Not close. Doesn't matter how big the bullseye is. We do not get close. We have sinned and missed the mark, holiness, righteousness, love of God by so far it minimizes that. It minimizes the cross. I have missed, we have missed by so far. That's where I can say, God can say, Dave, what gives you the right? What insignificant grievance, offense that you think you've accrued that has anything close to the mark that you have missed? And then Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sins. One verse in the middle of two chapters. And we focus on all the stuff that David did instead of the one verse of what God did. And that word taken away, put away, means to, to remove or go beyond. Amen? Remove or go beyond. When he died on that cross and forgave our sins, he removed them. He has gone beyond them. What right do I have not to go beyond? When God tells me to love, he doesn't tell me to love when it's easy. He tells me to love until it feels like your bones are being pulled out of joint. It's not a comfortable love. It's not a comfortable for forgiveness he's asking for. In, uh, we're going to go to Psalm 51, verse 12. So if you want to flip there, just kind of, in, in Psalm 139, verse 16, right? David wrote to us that our days are appointed. They are written in God's book, and they were written there before even one of them came about, right? So what is he saying? We have X amount of days. God knows how many are. I don't. Right? So many days. Moses wrote in Psalm 90 that since we understand the brevity of our life, since we have only that one that is here and the dot there, this determinate time God has given us, let us live those determinate days wisely. Wisely. With wisdom. With wisdom. There was an uh, old country western philosopher Freddie Fender <laughs> sang a song, Wasted Days and Wasted Nights. The thing about it is, okay, he was wasting them on whatever he was wasting them on. Booze, I don't know, whiskey, coke, whatever he was wasting them on. Day and night, wasted days. Why? Because they accomplished nothing. Right? For me, for us, how many days and nights and weeks and years are I going to waste the days and nights on things that I should have let go and gone beyond years ago? Look what it did to Freddie Fender. Do you think Freddie Fender ever found anything later unless he found God except more wasted days and wasted nights? Am I going to go from here again and live another day of wasting my day and wasting my night in that realm of guilt and grudge? Please. Please. He said, I'm going to die so you can live a life of guilt and grudge and determinate sentences? When he gets home, when we get home, he's going to welcome us regardless? Regardless? There ain't one person in here starting right here that doesn't have a list of accepts that I've run out of paper and ink. 
There was only one that didn't have the accept, and he died for all of us that had the big list of accepts. Thank you, Jesus. Psalm 52. Psalm 52 and verse 12. I better get there myself. Psalm 52. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Psalm 51, verse 12. Is, is David's psalm. And he wrote it probably a year or so after that whole thing with Bathsheba and all those things. So David was walking around, and if you read some of the other psalms, you know, as he was writing this, he said he had basically his bones were disintegrating. He had this life that he couldn't get rid of all of this weight that was on him. So he writes in Psalm 51... Where did I put it? Oh, I'm sorry. Verse, Psalm 51, verse 12. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Restore to me. If you have, need something restored to you, what does that mean? You don't have it anymore. You don't have it anymore. And restore in the Hebrew means to bring back to the place from that which you have departed. Right? doesn't mean somebody came by and picked you up and took you there. It means whatever came by, you got on. Voluntarily. Got on. So David is saying, restore to me. Bring me back to that place that I started from. And that, that word salvation, the joy of my salvation, remember last week when we did the communion, Yasha? Same word. Bring me back to the Yasha, the place of deliverance and salvation that I could not get to myself. Then he says, and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. We have to seek the willing spirit, friends. If I'm sitting here bound up in the things that I think I can do, what kind of spirit am I living in? What kind of spirit am I walking in? Not one that's open to the things of God. Not one that are leading to, by the leadings of God. It's a vault. And I've already taken the, the spin. I've spun it. I've lost the key because I'm not letting anybody in. David's saying, I need that restoration of that joy, the gladness, the glad tidings, the rejoicing that comes with your salvation. Just like before, if anybody has any grudges, it's a pertinent question. And we might want to answer it. You might want to pretend. You know, I had to. How many people in this house of God right now are truly living in the joy of the Lord? Come on. Bits and pieces? Well, you expect me to live in the joy of the Lord all the time? Okay. <laughs> Is it up to us? Is it up to us how much of the joy of the Lord we live in? Is it up to us how much of each day and each week and each hour did I live in the joy of the Lord? Yes. So David, this is King David, obviously the joy had departed. He's saying, bring me back to that place that I have departed from. Me, any of us in this place right now, if you want back, if you want that joy of the Lord, guess what? Ask. Lord, I'm in this place. I'm in this situation. I've got this grudge. I've got this heart that is not open and willing to you. Help me. Restore not the joy, but restore also that pliable heart and spirit that needs to live in me. Is it easy? Well, that wasn't easy. But he followed through from beginning to end. Will it be easy for us? I believe with the Holy Spirit who does live in us, it will be as easy as we allow it to be. I truly do. Lord, like we used to tell our kids, you can do it the easy way or you can do it the hard way. 
And nine times out of ten, they chose the hard way. And ten times out of ten, we'll choose the hard way. But it doesn't have to be that way. Amen? Okay. We are... What happens, we're going to go to Hebrews 12 real quick, then we're going to... Charles Haddon Spurgeon said that the, and it's interesting, the door, the door, singular, of repentance leads to the hallways, plural, of joy. If we just start to talk to God, say, Lord, I'm, I'm sorry. I am sorry. Find a brother and a sister. Find a child. Find a husband. Find... I'm sorry. I don't care about the accept anymore. We've wasted too much time, too many days, too many years in this marriage, in this family, holding on to this stuff. Forgive me. I don't care about the accepts anymore. I just want to love you. I, I, I want to love you in spite of the accept. Jesus loves us in spite of the accept. Hebrews 12. They're going to get to the rocks. Everybody got one, right? Hebrews 12, verses 14 and 15. Now, we all know about the book of Hebrews. Some parts they understand it's written to believers. Some parts is written to unbelievers. And he's writing to, it would be like this, the letter went and the assembly was here. Some were saved, some weren't. Okay, take the context as it was. Some, like Rick can tell you, interpretation, only one. Application, many. Okay? Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. We are to live at peace with all men. We are to live in exceptional peace with those of the household of God. See to it that no one misses the oh, see to it that no one misses the grace of God. Luther said there's two parts to repentance. The first part is recognizing sin, and oh, are we good at that? We've got planks and beams sticking out. We can't turn around. I'm not slapping somebody because oh, look at that board. That guy, that guy's got a. We have passed two by fours. We're in a four by four, six by sixes. We're we got big things coming out of our eye. But the only ones we see are the ones in other people's eye. I'm going blind looking at your sin. I recognize everything you've done wrong. All of it. But look what the next part, look what it says in the latter part of that. See to it that no one misses the grace of God. And that no bitter root grows up that causes trouble and defile many. If I don't understand the grace that I've received, if I don't understand that God has given so much grace to me, that if I don't give that grace out, a bitter root will grow. And that bitterness means acridity. It means, and especially in, in the language, it means that that had to do with poison. Poison was always pictured as bitter. And there is a bitter root that will grow and it will poison everything that it comes in contact with. Even the assembly of God. Because that's what the book was written to. That was the letter was written to. And we know, Lewis can tell you, anybody that's worked in the garden, pull a weed after the rain because the soil is soft. And you pull out that weed and all the root comes with it. If you wait till that soil dries and you pull the root, it breaks off at the soil line, and all you got is a bigger root next time because the root is still there. Is the root still here? Is the root still in me? Is there that, has it been pulled off at the soil line and it's looking real, you can't see it? Just wait for it to sprout again, saints. Wait for it to sprout again. We all have our stones. Everybody have a stone? Like we were saying when we started, a good Christian life 
needs, we like these. We put them in all our pockets, we put them in our purses, we put them wherever we can, right? Bigger purse, more rocks, you know, fill them up, trunk, whatever it can be, right? And the thing about this is, it's like grace and forgiveness. It's my choice what I do with this. Amen? My choice. You can leave here today, right? And some will drop this rock, but you'll still leave with it. You'll still leave with it. Because it's, it's too precious to us. I don't know, one of them religions, or they used to have that kind of thing where you go, you, you used to go like this, and you rub it with your thumb, and it takes away worries or some kind. It's like your stress thing. Which always seemed weird to me because you got the stone to rub. Why not get rid of the stone that causes you to have to rub it? Amen? When, um, in John 8, when they brought the woman caught in adultery, correct? They said, Look what we've done. We've caught this lady and she's here and we're, we're going to, we all got rocks. We all got stones, and we're going to throw, we need to stone this woman. So Jesus, he, you know, starts scribbling around in the dirt. Everybody tries to tell you what he's, he wasn't writing nothing, because he'd already spoken that you who have the first to sin without cast a stone. He was just down there biding time until it sunk in. <laughs> Seriously, come on, folks. He... It isn't what he wrote. They couldn't have seen it as what he spoke that touched them. So he says, if any of you don't have a sin, throw it. Then what's the book say? From the oldest down, they turned and left. And if you see movies, like even in The Passion, what happens? They, when they turn to go, they drop them. The Bible doesn't say they dropped them. It said they turned and left. They kept them stones because they knew, they knew that they were recognizing sin and not wondering and wonderment over grace. So they said, I'm going to keep this stone because give me an hour or two, I'm going to have somebody I can pitch this at. <laughs> True story. True story. It, like you said, go and read it. Read it yourself. It says they turned and left. When Jesus brought Lazarus out of the grave in John 11, Right? I'm the resurrection and the life. I bring life to things that are dead. Correct? Roll away the stone. He told, he didn't roll, he told who? He told the people there, roll away the stone. His part, our part. There's always his part, our part. So he rolls away the stone. Lazarus, come out! Come out, come out, come out! What did Lazarus do? He came out. How did Lazarus come out? Came out bound. He came out bound hand and foot. Couldn't work, couldn't serve, and couldn't go. And if you read it, he had a napkin around his mouth. He couldn't speak. Alive, brought back from the dead, and as bound and as bound as he went in. What did Jesus say? He looked to the same people. He told them, loose him and let him go. Loose him and let him go. We have the choice in this place today, friends. Whoever we came with, whoever we're going to see later, whoever the accept is, we have the choice. And when we come and we talk to one another, when they leave, have they been loosed by me or are they still bound by me? Am I speaking freedom into someone's life or am I speaking imprisonment into their lives? We have no right to bind people. We have no right in the name of Jesus to do anything but to encourage. Yes, we confront the things that need to be done, but that does not mean after confronting them we imprison them. When that, when that man was having incestuous relationships in 1 Corinthians, they said, yes, put him out, let the devil have his way. But when he repents and comes back, you do what? You embrace him. Embrace him. So my question today, my question today, 
Do you want to, only you know with you and God what this stone represents. You know the grudge. You know the accept. You know that indeterminate or determinate sensing that you're holding someone in right now. You know it. God knows it. You understand? We, I can come and pray. One of these days I'm going to come in a suit. Carl's going to fall out because you got boots and Levi's. But you know what? I'm st I'll still be the same inside. It doesn't matter if i got a $5,000 on 90 suit on. I can come in flip-flops and Bermuda shorts if my heart is right. Amen? Amen? Think. Come on. Rick dresses great. But Rick be the first to tell you it's not an indication of what's in his heart. What's in our heart? So my question is, and whoever should feel so moved, we're not going to have praise worship as we go out of here today. What we're going to do, if you choose, to say today is the last day of my accept with someone. Today, the person I've had that indeterminate, that determinate sentence I've held on them, today it ends. Not within word, but in deed. Right? If that be the case, if that be the case, if you want to bow your heads, if you want to close your eyes, if you want to think about who God is putting on your heart, and when that point has come, when that point has truly come, just drop the stone by your chair and go in peace. And go in peace. Oh, and by the way, for the type A personalities who are already wondering who's going to pick the stones up, <laughs> someone already has. Go in peace. <laughs>